Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama. And now chapter 6, Devahuti Desires Transcendental Knowledge. Text 7. Devahutir Uvacha Nirvana Nitaram Bhuman Asad Indriya Tarshanat Yena Sambhavya Manena Prapanandam Tama Prabhu Translation Devahuti said, I am very sick of the disturbance caused by my material senses. For because of this sense disturbance, my Lord, I have fallen into the abyss of ignorance. PURPORT Here at the beginning of Devahuti's questionings, the word Asad Indriya Tarshanat is significant. Asat means impermanent, temporary. Indriya means senses, and Tarshanat refers to agitation. Thus, Asad Indriya Tarshanat means from being agitated by the temporarily manifest senses of the material body. We are evolving through different species of material bodily existence, sometimes in a human body, sometimes in an animal body, and therefore the engagements of our material senses are also changing. Anything which changes is called temporary or asat. We should know that beyond these temporary senses are our permanent senses, which are now covered by the material body. The permanent senses, being contaminated by matter, are not acting properly. Devotional service, therefore, involves freeing the senses from this contamination. When the contamination is completely removed and the senses act in the purity of unalloyed Krishna consciousness, we have then attained sad indriya or eternal sense activities. Eternal sensory activities are called devotional service, whereas temporary sensory activities are called sense gratification. Unless one becomes tired of material sense gratification, there is no opportunity to hear transcendental messages from a person like Kapila. Devahuti expressed that she was tired. Now that her husband had left home, she wanted to get relief by hearing the instructions of Lord Kapila. The Vedic literatures describe this material world as darkness. Actually, it is dark, and therefore we require sunlight, moonlight, and electricity. If it were not by nature dark, why would we require so many arrangements for artificial light? The Vedas enjoin that we should not remain in darkness. Tamasi ma jyotiya gama. We are instructed to go to the light and that light is the spiritual world, which is directly lighted by the effulgence or bodily rays of Krishna. As stated in Brahma Samhita, chapter 5, verse 40, Yasya prabha prabhavato jagad anda koti kotish vashesha vasudadi vibhuti binam tad brahma nishkalamanantam ashesha bhutam Govinda Mari Purusham Tam Maham Bajami, which means, quote, I worship Govinda, the primeval Lord, who is endowed with great power. The glowing effulgence of his transcendental form is the impersonal Brahman, which is absolute 
complete and unlimited and which displays the varieties of countless planets with their different opulences in millions and millions of universes." Unquote. Animals have no ability to know that they are in darkness, but human beings can know. Like Devahuti, an intelligent person should become disgusted with the darkness of ignorance. Nahanyate hanyamane sharire. As stated in Bhagavad Gita, chapter 2, verse 20, there is neither birth nor death for the soul. The soul is not destroyed when the body is annihilated. The soul puts bodies on and takes them off like clothes. This simple knowledge is instructed in the beginning of Bhagavad Gita, yet there are many big scholars and leaders who still cannot understand that the body is different from the person. This is because they do not study Bhagavad Gita in the proper way. Consequently, no one is fully aware or convinced that the real person is not the body. This is called darkness, and when one is disgusted with this darkness, human life begins. One who has become disgusted with material existence needs the instructions of a guru. Tasman gurum prapadyeta jigyasu shreya uttamam. Being the wife of a great yogi, Devahuti understood her constitutional position. Therefore, she is placing her problem before her son, Kapiladev, an incarnation of God. Although Kapiladev is her son, Devahuti does not hesitate to take instructions from him. She does not say, Oh, he is my son. What can he tell me? I am his mother, and I shall instruct him. Instruction has to be taken from one who is in knowledge. It doesn't matter what his position is, whether he is a son, a boy, a shudra, brahmin, sannyasi, or grahasta. One should simply learn from one who knows. That is Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's instruction. Although Chaitanya Mahaprabhu himself was a brahmin and a sannyasi, he took instructions from Ramananda Rai, who was a shudra and grahasta, but nonetheless very exalted spiritually. When Chaitanya Mahaprabhu saw that Ramananda Rai was hesitant to give instructions, the Lord said, Why are you hesitating? Although you are a grahasta and born in a shudra family, I am prepared to take lessons from you. Kiba Vipra, Kiba Nyasi, Shudra Kene Naya, Ye Krishna Tattva Veta Se Guru Haya. From the Chaitanya Charitamrita, Madhya Lila, Chapter 8, Verse 128. This is Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's teaching. Whoever is qualified in Krishna consciousness can become a guru. His family or material identity does not matter. He simply must know the science. When we consult an engineer, a doctor, or a lawyer, we do not ask whether he is a Brahmin or a Shudra. If he is qualified, he can help with a particular subject. Similarly, if one knows the science of Krishna, he can be a guru. Devahuti was taking lessons from her son because he knew the science of Krishna. Even if gold is in a filthy place, we should take it. It is also stated in the Vedas that if a girl is highly qualified or beautiful, she can be accepted in marriage, even though born in a lower family. Thus it is not birth that is important, but qualification. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu wanted everyone in India to know the science of Krishna and preach Krishna consciousness. This is very simple. We need only repeat what Krishna has said or what has been said about Krishna in the Vedic literatures. Human society cannot be happy without Krishna consciousness. 
Krishna is the supreme enjoyer, and we are his servants. The master is enjoying, and the servants are helping the master enjoy. We living entities are eternal servants of God, and our duty is to help our master enjoy. Srimati Radharani is the topmost servant of Krishna, and her business is always to keep Krishna pleased. Krishna is very fond of Radharani because she renders the best service. Her 64 qualifications are mentioned in the Vedic literatures. Unfortunately, in the material world, we are busy trying to enjoy our material senses. As stated in Bhagavad Gita, chapter 3, verse 42, Indriyani paranyahur, Indriye bya paramana, Manasas tu para budir, yo bude para tas tu sa, which means, quote, The working senses are superior to dull matter. Mind is higher than the senses. Intelligence is still higher than the mind. And he, the soul, is even higher than the intelligence. Unquote. The soul is on the spiritual platform. On the material platform, we are interested in gratifying our senses. In this way, we become implicated in the laws of nature. As stated in the Shastras, Nunam pramata kurute vikarma yad indriya pritaya apranoti nasadu manye yata atmano yam asanapi klesha da asa deha which means, quote, when a person considers sense gratification the aim of life, he certainly becomes mad after materialistic living and engages in all kinds of sinful activity. He does not know that due to his past misdeeds, he has already received a body which, although temporary, is the cause of his misery. Actually, the living entity should not have taken on a material body but he has been awarded the material body for sense gratification. Therefore, I think it not befitting an intelligent man to involve himself again in the activities of sense gratification by which he perpetually gets material bodies one after another." Unquote. From the Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 5, Chapter 5, Verse 4. Living entities in this material world are very busy trying to gratify their senses. In the street, we see many dogs assembled for sex. This may seem very crude, but human beings are engaged in the same business, perhaps in a more elaborate way. We should know that sense gratification is meant for animals, and that sense control is for human beings. By tapasya, penance, we can purify ourselves and regain our eternal life. Actually, our material senses are not our real senses. They are covered, just as the body is covered by clothes. Our real body is within the material body. Dehino sminyata dehe. The spiritual body is within the material body. The material body is changing, going through childhood, youth, then old age, and then it vanishes. Although this is not our real body, we are engaged in sense gratification with it. 
However, for our own ultimate happiness, we should try to purify our senses. There is no question of destroying the senses or becoming desireless. Desire is a material activity, and becoming desireless is not possible. The senses must be purified in order for us to act through them transcendentally. Bhakti Yoga does not require us to destroy our senses but to purify them. When the senses are purified, we can serve Krishna. Sarvo padi vinir muktam, tat parat vena nirmalam, rishikena rishikesha, sevanam bhaktir uchite, which means, quote, Bhakti or devotional service means engaging all our senses in the service of the Lord, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the master of all the senses. When the spirit soul renders service unto the Supreme, there are two side effects. One is freed from all material designations, and simply by being employed in the service of the Lord, one's senses are purified. Unquote from the Narada Pancharatra. We can serve Rishikesh, the master of the senses, through the senses. We are part and parcel of Krishna, just as the hand is part and parcel of the body. Similarly, our senses are also part and parcel of the spiritual body of Krishna. When we purify our senses, we can act in our original constitutional position and serve Krishna. When we forget our position and try to satisfy ourselves, we become conditioned materially. When we forget that our duty is to serve Krishna, we fall into the material world and become implicated in personal sense gratification. As long as we continue trying to satisfy our own senses, we have to accept another body. Krishna is so kind that if we want to become tigers, he will give us a tiger body. If we want to become devotees, he will give us the body of a devotee. This life is a preparation for the next. And if we want to enjoy our transcendental senses, we have to purify ourselves to return home back to Godhead. For this purpose, Devahuti is submitting to her son just as a disciple submits to his master. And now text 8. Tasya tvam tamason dasya dushparas yadya paragam sach chakshur janmanam ante labdam me tvara nugrahat. Translation Your Lordship is my only means of getting out of this darkest region of ignorance because you are my transcendental eye which by your mercy only I have attained after many, many births. Purport This verse is very instructive since it indicates the relationship between the spiritual master and the disciple. The disciple or conditioned soul is put into this darkest region of ignorance and therefore is entangled in the material existence of sense gratification. It is very difficult to get out of this entanglement and attain freedom, but if one is fortunate enough to get the association of a spiritual master like Kapila Muni or his representative, then by his grace one can be delivered from the mire of ignorance. The spiritual master is therefore worshipped as one who delivers the disciple from the mire of ignorance with the light of the torch of knowledge. The word paragam is very significant. Paragam refers to one who can take the disciple to the other side. This side is conditioned life. The other side is the life of freedom. The spiritual master takes the disciple to the other side by opening his eyes with knowledge. 
we are suffering simply because of ignorance. By the instruction of the spiritual master, the darkness of ignorance is removed, and thus the disciple is enabled to go to the side of freedom. It is stated in Bhagavad Gita that after many, many births, one surrenders to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Similarly, if after many, many births, one is able to find a bona fide spiritual master and surrender to such a bona fide representative of Krishna, he can be taken to the side of light. The bona fide spiritual master is a true Vedantist, for he actually knows Vedanta and the Vedas, and he understands the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Krishna. The word Veda means knowledge, and Anta means last phase. There are different types of knowledge. We are interested in ordinary knowledge for economic benefit, but that is not actual knowledge. That is the art of livelihood. One may study to be an electrician and earn his livelihood by repairing electric lines. This kind of knowledge is called Shilpa Gyan. Real knowledge, however, is Vedic knowledge, knowing oneself, what one is and what God is, and understanding one's relationship with God and one's duty. One who is searching after knowledge is called Gyanaban. Knowledge begins with the inquiry Atato Brahma Jigyasa. What is Brahman? Knowledge also begins by understanding the threefold miseries of the material world Adhyatmika, Adibodhika, and Adidaivika. We are suffering from miseries caused by other living entities and acts of nature as well as from miseries arising from the body and mind themselves. The soul is aloof from the body and mind, but he suffers due to material contamination. We have no control over these threefold miseries. They are controlled by Krishna's maidservant, Goddess Durga, who is material nature. She is not independent of Krishna. However, she is so powerful that she can create and maintain. Prakriti, nature, can be very unkind. Mother Durga is often portrayed as chastising demons by piercing them with a trident. Those who are learned and intelligent look to the mercy of the Supreme Personality of Godhead for relief from the threefold miseries of material existence. Although this material world is nothing but darkness, people are very proud of their eyes. They are always saying, Can you show me God? The answer to that is, Have you the eyes to see God? Why is the emphasis placed on seeing? Certainly God can be seen, as stated in Brahma Samhita, chapter 5, verse 38, Premanjana Churita Bhakti Velochanena, which means, quote, Govinda, or Krishna, is always seen by the devotee whose eyes are anointed by the pulp of love." Unquote. If we are devotees, lovers of God, the ointment of love will clear our eyes. In order to see God, we have to cleanse our eyes by wiping away the cataracts of material contamination. Although we may be eager to see God, we cannot see Him with these material eyes. Not only can we not see Him, but we cannot understand Him, although His name is there. Understanding God means, first of all, understanding His name. Therefore, from the beginning, we should chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. God is not different from His name. Krishna's name and Krishna's person are the same. Absolute means that Krishna's name, form, place, dress, pastimes, and everything are non-different from Him. Krishna is present in His name, but because we have no love for Him, we cannot see Him.
Sanatan Goswami was a great learned scholar, and he was called a pundit, which indicates that he was a learned Brahmin. When Sanatan Goswami approached Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he said, The people in my neighborhood are calling me a pundit, and I am very unhappy because of this. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu asked, Why are you dissatisfied? Sanatan Goswami replied, I am such a poor pundit that I do not even know the goal of life. I do not even know what is beneficial for me. I am simply being carried away by sense gratification. In this way, Sanatan Goswami approached Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. He did not approach him to get some gold or some medicine. He went to find out his real self-interest. This is the real purpose for approaching a guru. Devahuti approached Lord Kapila Dev in the same way. She said, My dear Kapila, you have come as my son, but you are my guru because you can inform me how I can cross the ocean of nescience, which is the material world. Thus, one who feels the need to cross the dark ocean of nescience, which is material existence, requires a guru. It is not the guru's task to supply gold and medicine. Now it has become a fashion to keep a guru as if he were a dog or a cat. This is of no use. We must inquire about that portion of God's creation which is beyond this darkness. The Upanishads and Bhagavad Gita describe another world beyond this material nature. According to Krishna in Bhagavad Gita, chapter 15, verse 6, Natad Basayate Suryo Na Shashanko Na Pavaka Yadgatva Na Nivartante Tadama Paramamama Which means, quote, that abode of mine is not illumined by the sun or moon, nor by electricity. One who reaches it never returns to this material world." Unquote. It is not possible for us to go to that paravyoma by material means. It is impossible to penetrate the material universe unless one understands Krishna. One can be enlightened by the mercy of God because Krishna himself comes to give us information. If he does not come personally, he sends his devotee, or he leaves behind him Bhagavad Gita. However, we are so foolish that we do not take advantage of them. We do not take advantage of his devotee who hankers to give this knowledge, sacrificing everything. Therefore, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, Ramanda Brahmate Kona Bhagyavan Jiva Guru Krishna Prasade Paya Bhakti Lata Bija which means, quote, the fallen conditioned living entity, trapped by the external energy, loiters in the material world. But if by good fortune he meets a bona fide representative of the Lord, and if he takes advantage of such a guru, he receives the seed of devotional service." Unquote. From the Chaitanya Charitamrita, Madhyalila, chapter 19, verse 151. The seed of devotional service is received by a most fortunate person. Those who are cultivating bhakti in the International Society for Krishna Consciousness are the most fortunate people in the world. By Krishna's mercy, one can receive the bhakti lata bij, the seed of devotional service. Unless one is free from the reactions of sin, one cannot understand bhakti or bhagavan. Therefore, we must act piously by giving up illicit sex, intoxication, meat-eating, and gambling. If we lead a pious life, we can understand God. This Krishna consciousness movement is engaged in training people to this end so that their lives will be successful.
And now text 9. Ya adyo bhagavan pumsam Ishvaro vai bhavan kila Lokasya tamasandasya Chakshu surya ivodita Translation You are the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the origin and Supreme Lord of all living entities. You have arisen to disseminate the rays of the sun in order to dissipate the darkness of the ignorance of the universe. Purport Kapila Muni is accepted as an incarnation of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Krishna. Here the word Adya means the origin of all living entities, and Pumsam Ishvara means the Lord, Ishvara, of the living entities. Ishvara Parama Krishna. Kapila Muni is the direct expansion of Krishna, who is the son of spiritual knowledge. The sun dissipates the darkness of the universe. And when the light of the Supreme Personality of Godhead comes down, it at once similarly dissipates the darkness of Maya. We have our eyes, but without the light of the sun, our eyes are of no value. Similarly, without the light of the Supreme Lord, or without the divine grace of the spiritual master, one cannot see things as they are. In this verse, Devahuti also addresses her son as Bhagavan. Bhagavan is the Supreme Person. If we could just use a little common sense, we could understand that an organization requires a leader. Without a leader, we cannot organize anything. Foolish philosophers say that the universe automatically came into being by nature. They say that in the beginning there was a chunk and this cosmic manifestation came out of that chunk of matter. But where did this chunk come from? The fact is, there must be a brain, a leader, behind anything organized. We have information of this leader from the Vedas. Nityo Nityanam Chaitanas Chaitananam The Supreme Lord is eternal, and we are also eternal. But the Supreme Lord is one, and we are many. The Supreme Lord is very great, and we are very small. He is all-pervading and infinite, and we are finite and infinitesimal. Even if we analyze the creation, we will find that not everyone is on the same level. One person is more intelligent or opulent than another. If we analyze things in this way, we will come to the demigods, and among them we will find that the most important demigod is Lord Brahma. He is the original creature within this universe, yet he is not the most intelligent being. It is said that in the beginning Brahma received knowledge from the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Recently, newspapers are reporting that faith in a personal God is diminishing. This means that people are becoming more and more foolish. This is natural in Kali Yuga, for as the age of Kali progresses, bodily strength, memory and mercy diminish. We actually see that the present generation is not as strong as the previous. People also have short memories. We also understand that sometimes people are killed while other people pass by not caring. Thus mercy is also diminishing. Because everything is diminishing, God consciousness is diminishing also. Therefore it is natural to receive news that faith in a personal God is diminishing. In Bhagavad Gita chapter 7 verse 15, one who does not accept a personal God is described as a mudha, a fool. Namam dushkritino mudha, prabadyante naradama, mayaya paratagyana, 
Asuram Bhavam Ashwitaha, which means, quote, Those miscreants who are grossly foolish, lowest among mankind, whose knowledge is stolen by illusion, and who partake of the atheistic nature of demons, do not surrender unto me. Unquote. Actually, people today do not even know the meaning of God, so there is no question of surrender. There are also those who are scholarly and well-educated, but their knowledge is taken away by maya, illusion. Although they may superficially hold degrees, they have no real knowledge. They are also asuras, demons, who simply defy God, saying, I am God, you are God. Why are you searching for God? There are many gods loitering in the street. Take care of them. Therefore, it is not surprising that newspapers report that faith in a personal God is decreasing. Nonetheless, God is a person. Ya Adyo Bhagavan. Lord Brahma also worships Krishna by saying, Govindam Adi Purusham Tamaham Bajami. He says, quote, I worship that original person, Govinda. Unquote. Adi Purusham, Krishna, has no one preceding him. Therefore, he is called original. It is said that Krishna was born of Vasudeva, but this simply means that Krishna accepted Vasudeva as his father. Shri Krishna deals with his devotees in different relationships or rasas, Shanta, Dasya, Sakya, Vatsalya, and Madhurya. We all have some relationship with Krishna. But presently, that is covered. Therefore, we have to revive it. Simple appreciation of the Supreme is called Shanta Ras. When one appreciates the Supreme fully, he wishes to render some service, and that is called Dasya. When one becomes more intimate, he becomes a friend of Krishna's, and that is called Sakya. When one is more advanced, he wants to render service to Krishna as a father or a mother, and this is Vatsalya. Being a father or a mother means serving the Son. The Christian conception of God as the Supreme Father is not very perfect because if we conceive of God as a father, our position will be to take things from Him. Everyone wants to take something from the Father. One is always saying, Father, give me this. Father, give me that. However, accepting the Supreme Lord as one's son means rendering service. Yashoda Mai got Krishna as her son, and she was always anxious that he not be in danger. Thus, she was always protecting him. Actually, Krishna protects the entire universe, but Yashoda was giving protection to Krishna. This is Vaishnava philosophy. Yashoda became mad when she saw Krishna taken away by the Trinavrta demon. However, Krishna became so heavy that the demon could not fly in the sky, and thus the demon fell to the earth and died. Yashoda immediately said, God has saved my Krishna. She then began to thank some other god, some devata. She did not know that Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. If she had thought of Krishna as the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the relationship between mother and son would have been destroyed. Therefore, Krishna was playing just like an ordinary child, and Mother Yashoda was treating him as her son. Krishna's friends, the cowherd boys, did not consider him the Supreme Lord either. The gopis even used to chastise Krishna. If a devotee can have such a relationship with Krishna, why should he want to become one with God? It is better to be God's father, God's controller. This is bhakti marg, the path of devotional service. A devotee does not want to be equal to God or one with God. He simply wants to render service.
In order to understand the absolute truth, we have to understand the meaning of Bhagavan. Devahuti was not an ordinary woman. She was the wife of Kardama Muni, a great yogi. She had obviously learned something from her husband, for had she not been very exalted, how could Bhagavan Kapiladev have become her son? Everyone should know what is Bhagavan and take lessons from Bhagavan. Lord Kapila is Bhagavan, and he personally instructed his mother in Sankhya philosophy. By this knowledge we can develop or awaken our dormant love for God. Then we can see God when our eyes are anointed with love for Him. Indeed, we can see God everywhere and at all times. We will see God and nothing but God. We will see God not only within our hearts. If we go to the ocean, we will see God. If one is a little thoughtful, he will see that the great ocean stays in its place. The ocean has received its orders not to go beyond such and such a limit. Any intelligent man can see God while walking down the beach. However, this requires a little intelligence. People who are asses, mudhas, dushkritis cannot see God, but those who are intelligent can see God everywhere because God is omnipresent. He is within the universe and within our heart and He is even within the atom. Why are we saying that we cannot see Him? God says, try to see me in this way, but if you are too dull, then try to see me in another way. What is the easy way? Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, I am the taste of water. Is there anyone who has not tasted water? He also says, I am the light of the sun. Is there anyone who has not seen sunshine? Then why are people saying, I have not seen God? First of all, we have to try to see God. It is as easy as A, B, C, D. When we see God everywhere, we will see the personal God. Then we will understand. Bhagavan Pumsam Ishvara Bhagavan is Ishvara, the controller. We are not independent. No one can actually say, I am independent. We are bound tightly by the modes of material nature, and yet we are thinking that we are independent. This is simply foolishness. Therefore it is said that all the people in the material world are blinded by the darkness of ignorance. When people are blind, out of their ignorance they say, There is no God. I cannot see God. Then God comes as Krishna or Kapila Dev and says, Here I am. See my features. I am a person. I play the flute and enjoy myself in Vrindavan. Why can't you see me? Thus God comes, explains himself, and leaves behind his instruction, Bhagavad Gita. Still, people are so foolish that they claim not to understand God. If we try to see God through the instructions given to Devahuti by Lord Kapila, our lives will be successful. And now text 10. Atame Deva Samoham Apakrishtum Tvamaharsi Yovagraho Hamma Metit Yetasmin Yojitastvaya. Translation Now be pleased, my Lord, to dispel my great delusion. Due to my feeling of false ego, I have been engaged by your maya and have identified myself with the body and consequent bodily relations. Maya is the false ego of identifying one's body with oneself. 
and of claiming things possessed in relationship with the body. In Bhagavad Gita, 15th chapter, the Lord says, I am sitting in everyone's heart, and from me comes everyone's remembrance and forgetfulness. Devahuti has stated that false identification of the body with the self and attachment for bodily possessions are also under the direction of the Lord. Does this mean that the Lord discriminates by engaging one in his devotional service and another in sense gratification? If that were true, it would be an incongruity on the part of the Supreme Lord, but that is not the actual fact. As soon as the living entity forgets his real constitutional position of eternal servitorship to the Lord and wants instead to enjoy himself by sense gratification, he is captured by Maya. This capture leads to the consciousness of false identification with the body and attachment for the possessions of the body. These are the activities of Maya, and since Maya is also an agent of the Lord, it is indirectly the action of the Lord. The Lord is merciful. If anyone wants to forget Him and enjoy this material world, He gives Him full facility, not directly, but through the agency of His material potency. Therefore, since the material potency is the Lord's energy, indirectly it is the Lord who gives the facility to forget Him. Devahuti therefore said, my engagement in sense gratification was also due to you. Now kindly get me free from this entanglement. By the grace of the Lord, one is allowed to enjoy this material world. But when one is disgusted with material enjoyment and is frustrated, and when one sincerely surrenders unto the lotus feet of the Lord, then the Lord is so kind that he frees one from entanglement. Krishna says therefore in Bhagavad Gita, First of all, surrender, and then I will take charge of you and free you from all reactions of sinful activities. Sinful activities are those activities performed in forgetfulness of our relationship with the Lord. In this material world, activities for material enjoyment that are considered pious are also sinful. For example, one sometimes gives money in charity to a needy person with a view to get back the money four times increased. Giving with the purpose of gaining something is called charity in the mode of passion. Everything done here is done in the modes of material nature, and therefore all activities but service to the Lord are sinful. Because of sinful activities, we become attracted by the illusion of material attachment, and we think, I am this body. I think of the body as myself and of bodily possessions as mine. Devahuti requested Lord Kapila to free her from that entanglement of false identification and false possession. In asking this, Devahuti is accepting her son Kapila as her guru. He consequently tells her how to solve all material problems. Material life is nothing but sex attraction. Pumsa striya mituni bhavam etam. From the Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 5, Chapter 5, Verse 8. Material life means that men are after women and women are after men. We find this not only in human society, but in bird, dog, cat, and demigod society. As soon as people join to satisfy their sex desire, the attraction becomes greater and greater. An apartment is needed for privacy, and then one has to earn a livelihood and acquire some land. Without children, married life is frustrated, and of course the children have to be educated. Thus one becomes entangled in material life by creating so many situations, but at the time of death Krishna comes and takes away everything.
house, land, wife, children, friends, reputation, and whatever. Then we have to begin another life. It is not that we simply die and finish everything. We are living eternally. The body is finished, but we have to accept another body out of 8,400,000 forms. In this way, our life is going on, but we are thinking in terms of wife, children, and so forth. This is all illusion. In any case, we will not be allowed to stay here, and although we are attached to all this, everything will be taken away at death. Whatever post we are occupying, be it President or Lord Brahma, we are occupying temporarily. We may be here five years, ten years, one hundred years, or five million years. Whatever, our position is limited. Our position in the material world is not eternal, but we are eternal. Why then should we be illusioned by the non-eternal? By nature, we are part and parcel of Krishna, and Krishna is Satchit Ananda Vigraha. In order to transcend the darkness of material life and go to the world of light, we need to approach a guru. It is for this reason that Devahuti is approaching Lord Kapila Dev. In the morning, when the sun arises, the darkness of night immediately goes away. Similarly, when God or His Incarnation comes, the darkness of material life is dissipated. When Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, came, Arjuna's illusion was dispelled. He was thinking, why should I fight with my relatives? Actually, the whole world is going on under this conception of my and mine. There are fights between nations, societies, communities, and families. People are thinking, why are you interfering with my business? Then there is a fight. Because of illusion, we do not consider these situations temporary. On a train, people may argue and fight over a seat but one who knows that he will only be on the train for two or three hours thinks, why should I fight? I shall only be here for a short while. One person thinks in this way, and the other person is ready to fight, thinking that his seat is permanent. No one will be allowed to stay within this material world. Everyone will have to change his body and position, and as long as one remains here, he will have to fight and struggle for existence. This is the way of material life. We may temporarily make some compromises, but ultimately the material world is full of misery. We are very much attached to this material world, but according to the Vedic system, renunciation is compulsory, for when one reaches the age of 50, he renounces his family life. Nature gives warning. You are now past 50. That's all right. You have fought in this material world. Now stop this business. Children play on the beach and make houses out of sand. But after a while, the father comes and says, Now, my dear children, time is up. Stop this business and come home. This is the business of the guru, to teach his disciples detachment. The world is not our place. Our place is Vaikuntha Loka. Krishna also comes to remind us of this. The Dharma or order of the Supreme Person is to become His devotee and always think of Him. Krishna says, Manmana Bhava Mad Bhakto Madhyaji Mam Namaskuru, which means, quote, Engage your mind always in thinking of Me. Offer obeisances and worship me. Unquote. From the Bhagavad Gita, chapter 9, verse 34. In this
this way Krishna opens the door, but we unfortunately do not accept him. Krishna tells Arjun, Because you are my friend, I am revealing to you the most confidential dharma. What is that? Simply surrender unto me. This is the dharma taught by the Supreme Personality of Godhead, and Krishna's incarnation and his devotee will teach the same dharma. We are all after happiness, but we do not know how to enjoy happiness. We want to enjoy our senses, but it is not possible with these covered false senses. The senses must be opened, and that is the process of purification. We are thinking of ourselves according to so many false material identifications, but we should take Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's advice. Jivera Svarupa Haya, Krishnera Nitya Das. We must come to understand, I am the eternal servant of Krishna. After all, our senses are employed for the satisfaction of somebody, either for ourselves or for someone else. That is Kama, Kroda, Loba, and Matsara, illusion. If we are not serving our own lusty desires, or Kama, we are serving anger, Krodha. If I am the master of anger, I can control my anger. And if I am the master of my desires, I can control my desires. In any case, I am a servant, and my service should be transferred to Krishna. That is the perfection of life. If we are situated in the transcendental position, or bhakti, we can understand Krishna. Krishna cannot be understood by mental speculation. Otherwise, he would have said that he could be understood by jnana, karma, or yoga. However, he clearly says, bhaktiya mam abhijanati. Only by devotional service can I be understood. If we want to know Krishna as he is, we have to accept the process of bhakti. It is this bhakti process that Kapila Dev will reveal to Devahuti. And now text 11. Tam tva gata ham sharanam sharanyam sva vritya samsara toro kutaram jigyasa ya ham prakrite purushasya namami sadharma vidam varishtam. Translation Devahuti continued I have taken shelter of your lotus feet because you are the only person of whom to take shelter. You are the axe which can cut the tree of material existence. I therefore offer my obeisances unto you, who are the greatest of all transcendentalists, and I inquire from you as to the relationship between man and woman, and between spirit and matter. <laughs> Purport. 
Sankhya philosophy, as is well known, deals with Prakriti and Purusha. Purusha is the Supreme Personality of Godhead, or anyone who imitates the Supreme Personality of Godhead as an enjoyer, and Prakriti is nature. In this material world, material nature is being exploited by the Purushas, or the living entities. The intricacies in the material world of the relationship of the Prakriti and Purusha, or the enjoyed and the enjoyer, give rise to samsara or material entanglement. Devahuti wanted to cut the tree of material entanglement, and she found the suitable weapon in Kapila Muni. The tree of material existence is explained in the 15th chapter of Bhagavad Gita as an Ashvata tree, whose root is upward and whose branches are downward. It is recommended there that one has to cut the root of this material existential tree with the axe of detachment. What is the attachment? The attachment involves Prakriti and Purusha. The living entities are trying to lord it over material nature. Since the conditioned soul takes material nature to be the object of his enjoyment, and he takes the position of the enjoyer, he is therefore called Purusha. Devahuti questioned Kapila Muni, for she knew that only he could cut her attachment to this material world. The living entities, in the guises of men and women, are trying to enjoy the material energy. Therefore, in one sense, everyone is Purusha, because Purusha means enjoyer, and Prakriti means enjoyed. In this material world, both so-called men and women are imitating the real Purusha. The Supreme Personality of Godhead is actually the enjoyer in the transcendental sense, whereas all others are Prakriti. In Bhagavad Gita, matter is analyzed as a para, or inferior nature, whereas beyond this inferior nature, there is another superior nature, the living entities. Living entities are also Prakriti, or enjoyed, but under the spell of Maya, the living entities are falsely trying to take the position of enjoyers. That is the cause of samsara bandha, or conditional life. Devahuti wanted to get out of conditional life and place herself in full surrender. The Lord is Sharanya, which means the only worthy personality to whom one can fully surrender, because he is full of all opulences. If anyone actually wants relief, the best course is to surrender unto the Supreme Personality of Godhead. The Lord is also described here as Sadharma Vidam Varishtam. This indicates that of all transcendental occupations, the best is eternal loving service unto the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Dharma is sometimes translated as religion, but that is not exactly the meaning. Dharma actually means that which one cannot give up, that which is inseparable from oneself, the warmth of fire is inseparable from fire. Therefore, warmth is called the dharma, or nature, of fire. Similarly, sadharma means eternal occupation. That eternal occupation is engagement in the transcendental loving service of the Lord. The purpose of Kapila Dev's Sankhya philosophy is to propagate pure, uncontaminated devotional service and therefore he is addressed here as the most important personality among those who know the transcendental occupation of the living entity. As pointed out before, Bhagavan, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, is everyone's real shelter, Sharanam Sharanyam. Everyone is seeking shelter because we are all constitutionally servants. Originally, we are servants of God. Therefore, it is our nature to take His shelter. 
Some seek an occupation or the service of a great man. Others seek the service of the government or whatever. In any case, the ultimate shelter is Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Being Krishna's incarnation, Kapila Dev is also a shelter. Krishna has unlimited forms and unlimited incarnations. It is said in Srimad Bhagavatam that his incarnations are expanding continuously, like waves in the ocean. Indeed, we cannot even count them. In Brahma Samhita it is said, Advaitam Achutam Anadim Ananta Rupam. In India, there are many thousands of temples, and within these temples there are archa vigrahas, deities. All these Krishnas are non-different. They are one. Krishna resides in Vaikuntha and also in the temple. The Krishnas are not different, although they are ananta, unlimited. Krishna is also the witness within everyone's heart, and he is seeing all of our activities. We cannot hide anything from him, and we receive the results of our karma because the witness is Krishna himself within the heart. How then can we avoid him? Without Krishna's permission, we cannot do anything. Why does Krishna give us permission to do something wrong? He does so because we persist. Actually, he does not tell us to do anything other than surrender unto him. We want to do something, and Krishna may sanction it, but we go ahead and do it at our own risk. Krishna is not responsible. However, we should know that without the sanction of Krishna, we cannot do anything. That is a fact. Actually, we are constitutionally servants of Krishna. Even though we may declare ourselves independent, we are not. Rather, we are servants falsely declaring that we are independent. Self-realization is understanding that we are dependent on the Supreme Personality of Godhead. As Chaitanya Mahaprabhu says, Ai nanda tanuja kinkaram patitam mam vishame bhavam budo kripaya tava pada pankaja stitaduli sadrasham vichintaya which means, quote, my dear Lord Krishna, son of Maharaj Nanda, I am your eternal servant, but somehow or other I have fallen into this ocean of nescience. Please pick me up from this ocean of death and place me as one of the atoms at your lotus feet. Unquote. From Shikshashtaka, verse 5. Because we are under illusion, Devahuti says, Svabhritya samsara taro kutaram. In Bhagavad Gita, chapter 15, verses 1 through 4, material existence is likened unto a banyan tree with its roots upward and its branches below. The roots of this banyan tree are very strong, but they can be cut with an axe or kutaram. By taking shelter of Krishna's lotus feet, we can cut the strong root of material existence. Because we have given up Krishna's service, we have become servants of so many things. We are obliged to serve our parents, wife, children, country, and so forth. We are indebted to many people and to the demigods who give heat and light. Although we are not paying the bill, we are taking advantage of the sunlight and the sun's heat. If we take advantage of electricity, we have to pay the bill but we don't pay the sun bill. This means that we are actually indebted to the sun god, Vivasvan. Similarly, the king of heaven, Indra, is supplying water in the form of rain. Rascals say that all this comes about by nature, but they do not know that nature is controlled. If we don't pay our debts by performing sacrifices, there will certainly be a scarcity. All of these things are coming from the Supreme Father, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, but we are thinking that they are coming from nature, 
and we are utilizing them without caring whether we pay the bill or not. It is all right to use our father's property, but at the present moment we are not acting as our father's sons. We are Maya's sons. We do not care for our father. However, nature is nonetheless working under his direction. If we do not care for him, nature will reduce her supply, for nature will not allow demons to flourish. As stated in Bhagavad Gita, chapter 16, verse 19, Tanaham dvishata kruran, samsareshu naradaman, chipam yajasram ashuban, ashurish veva yonishu, which means, quote, Those who are envious and mischievous, who are the lowest among men, are cast by me into the ocean of material existence, into various demoniac species of life, unquote. Demons are always subject to be punished, and great demons like Ravan and Hiranyakashipu are personally punished by the Lord. Otherwise, ordinary demons are punished by the laws of material nature. Krishna does not need to come to punish the petty demons, but when there are great demons like Ravan, Hiranyakashipu, and Kamsa, the Lord comes as Lord Ramchandra, Lord Nasingadev, or Sri Krishna to punish them. If we do not want to be punished, we have to follow the rules and regulations, or sadharma. Dharma means the laws given by God. Dharmam tu sakshad bhagavat pranitam. The laws are given by Bhagavan and are written in books like Manu Samhita and other Vedic literatures. According to the law, we have to obey the government, and according to Dharma, we have to obey Krishna, God. We cannot manufacture our laws at home, and we cannot manufacture Dharma. If one tries, he is simply cheating the public. Such false dharmas are kicked out of Srimad Bhagavatam, as in Canto 1, Chapter 1, Verse 2, Dharma Projita. The real dharma is set forth by Sri Krishna when he says, Sarva dharman parityajya, mame kam sharanam vrja, from the Bhagavad Gita, Chapter 18, Verse 66. All other dharmas are simply forms of cheating. We must accept the principles of Bhagavad Gita, which constitute the ABCs of Dharma. Actually, we only have to accept the principle of surrender unto Krishna, but this acceptance comes after many, many births. It is not very easy, for only after many births of struggle does one come to his real perfection and surrender unto Krishna. At this time, he understands perfectly that Vasudeva, Krishna, is everything. This is the greatest lesson of Bhagavad Gita. Everything is Krishna's energy, and whatever we see is but an exhibition of two types of energy. Everyone knows that the sun has two types of energy, heat and light. Similarly, Krishna has an external energy and an internal energy and he also has a marginal energy, which is a mixture of the other two. The external energy is this material world. The internal energy is the spiritual world, and the marginal energy is the living entity. The living entity is marginal because he can remain in the material world or the spiritual world. Bhagavad Gita describes two types of living entities. Shada and Akshara, those living in the material world and those in the spiritual world. Those who have fallen into the material world are attracted by the tree of samsara, the banyan tree of material existence described in Bhagavad Gita in the 15th chapter. It is essential that we disassociate ourselves from this tree by detachment. Cutting down this tree is very difficult. 
but it is possible with the weapon of detachment. There is a Bengali proverb that states, quote, I'll catch the fish, but I will not touch the water, unquote. That type of intelligence is required. In America, we see many old men on the beach who have retired from their business to waste their time trying to catch fish. They are not very cautious, and they touch the water. However, we have to live in this material world in such a way that we do everything for Krishna, but do not touch the water of the material world. In this way, we will have no attachment to things of this material world. We have many great temples, but we should not be attached to them. It is for Krishna's sake that we construct temples, but we must understand that the temples are Krishna's property. Our mission is to teach people that everything belongs to Krishna. Only a thief will occupy something belonging to another and claim it to be his. The Krishna Consciousness Movement preaches that everything belongs to Krishna and that everything should be utilized for Krishna's benefit. He is the beneficiary of everything, and it is to our benefit that we come to this knowledge. Isha vasyam midam sarvam. If one realizes that everything belongs to Krishna, one becomes the greatest Mahatma. Being a Mahatma does not mean that one wears a big beard and a particular type of dress. No, this awareness must be there. Whatever we have should be offered to Krishna. If we have first-class food, we should offer it to Him. If we have nothing, we can offer Him a leaf, a flower, a little water or fruit. This can be collected by anyone, anywhere, without having to pay money. As Sri Krishna states in Bhagavad Gita, chapter 9, verse 26, Patram Pushpam Palam Toyam Yome Bhaktya Priyachiti Tad Aham Bhaktyupartam Ashnami Prayat Atmana Which means, quote, If one offers me with love and devotion a leaf, a flower, fruit, or water, I will accept it, unquote. The point is that we should offer something to Krishna with devotion. It is not that Krishna is hungry and is asking for food. No, He is feeding everyone, supplying everyone with all the necessities. Eko bahunam yo vidadati kaman. As stated in the Kata Upanishad 2.2.13. What then is He requesting? He is asking for bhakti, devotion, because He wants us to love Him. We are suffering in this material world, entangled in the tree of material existence, moving from one branch to another, and because of this we are suffering. Krishna does not want us to suffer, jumping like monkeys from branch to branch. We must come to Him and surrender to Him. When we come to this knowledge, we become perfect in knowledge. When we take shelter at the lotus feet of Krishna, we are no longer debtors to anyone. Nakinkaro Nayam Rini From the Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 11, Chapter 5, Verse 41 Krishna assures us, Aham Tvam Sarva Pape Bhyo Moksha Yishyami Which means, I'll give you all relief. From the Bhagavad Gita, chapter 18, verse 66. This is what we actually want. Therefore, Devahuti herein takes shelter of Kapila Dev and tells him, You are the axe capable of making me detached. When our attachment to the material world is severed, we become free. Bhakti is the means by which we can develop this detachment. Viragya Vidya Nija Bhakti Yoga Bhakti Yoga is the science of detachment. This verse was composed by Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya when he understood that Lord Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was the Supreme Personality of Godhead. 
Sarvabhuma Bhattacharya was a great logician, and he composed a hundred verses to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, wherein he tells the Lord, Varagya Vidya Nija Bhakti Yoga, Shikshartam Eka Purusha Purana, Shri Krishna Chaitanya Sharira Dari, Kripambudiya Yastham Maham Prapadye, which means, quote, let me take shelter of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Sri Krishna, who has descended in the form of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu to teach us real knowledge, his devotional service, and detachment from whatever does not foster Krishna consciousness. He has descended because he is an ocean of transcendental mercy. Let me surrender unto his lotus feet." Unquote from the Chaitanya Charitamrita, Madhya Lila, chapter 6, verse 254. When a person advances in Bhakti Yoga, he will automatically become detached from material attractions. There are many American and European boys and girls in this Krishna consciousness movement who have been born in countries where they can enjoy a good deal of material affluence but they consider this material happiness and affluence like garbage in the street. Because they are devotees of Vasudeva, they are no longer attached to these material things. This is the result of Bhakti Yoga, which enables one to be detached from material enjoyment. That detachment is the sign that one is advancing in Bhakti Yoga. Bhakti Pareshanu Bhavo Virakta from the Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 11, Chapter 2, Verse 42. That is the test of advancing in bhakti. If we are advanced, we are no longer attached to material enjoyment. It is not that we think ourselves great devotees and then go ahead and enjoy material things. As stated in Bhagavad Gita, Chapter 5, Verse 22, Ye hi samsparshaja boga, dukha yonaya evate, adyanta vanta konteya, nateshu ramate buddha. Which means, quote, An intelligent person does not take part in the sources of misery, which are due to contact with the material senses. O son of Kunti, such pleasures have a beginning and an end and so the wise man does not delight in them." Unquote. When one sees something superior, he immediately rejects that which is inferior. Actually, we cannot bring all this about by our own endeavor. Therefore, we have to take shelter of Krishna, and he will help. Since our only business is to take shelter of Krishna, Devahuti says, I am taking shelter of you so that you can cut my attachment to this material life. Why should you do this? Because I am your eternal servant. Bhaktivinoda Thakur says, Anadi karama pale, padi bavarnava jale, tari bare na deki upaya. If we are thrown into the ocean, there is a great struggle, even if we may be very great swimmers. There is no peace in this material world, however expert we may be in dealing with it. There is nothing but struggle. We cannot live here peacefully. It is not possible. Even if we are non-violent and hurt no one, there will be trouble. However, if somehow or other we manage to reach the shore, we will find peace. There is peace even if we are an inch out of the water. Pava pada pankaja stita duli sadrasham vichintaya From the Shikshashtika, verse 5. If somehow or other we become one of the particles of dust at Krishna's lotus feet, we will be liberated. We may be a Hindu or a Muslim or a Christian for fifty or sixty years, or at the utmost one hundred, but again we have to take birth and be something else. 
We are thinking in terms of these religious designations, which are called asad dharma, meaning that they may change at any moment. But what is our real dharma? Real dharma is sad dharma, that which will not change. And this sad dharma necessitates surrendering unto Krishna. This dharma will continue eternally. There are many propounders of sad dharma, but actually the Supreme Personality of Godhead is the best propounder because he knows the reality. It is therefore said of the Goswamis, Nana Shastra Vichara Naika Nipono Sadharma Samstapako. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's direct disciples, the Goswamis, tried to establish Sadharma, and we are trying to follow in their footsteps by establishing real Dharma throughout the world with this Krishna consciousness movement. <laughs> 